You're listening to the UKC Hunting Ops Podcast, celebrating hunting dog heritage, competition, and community. United Kennel Club has been the hunting dog sports home for coonhounds, beagles, retrievers, pointers, cur feist, and more for over 125 years. Well, hey, folks, here we are again on another podcast. I'm uh, joined with Trevor Wade here today. I'm Alan Gingrich, but you're going to be in the passenger seat today. Yeah, that's a little different role for me today. I yeah. like it. Normally, you're driving this car here. <laughs> <laughs> you get to do the intros, and they get to take a picture of you for the thumbnail and all yeah. the all the embarrassing stuff yeah. down here. <laughs> yeah, well, hey, I need a little practice anyway. So so today, we're let's switch gears a little bit, and we're going to talk about some Beagle stuff, maybe. Perfect. That work for you? Yeah. Look, I've taken you, you to here. a couple of events now, so you should about you should be a pro by now, right? Yeah, I've been to a couple of gun dogs. I went to the Hunting Beagle Nationals, and we got plans to go to the Hunting Beagle World this year. So I'm excited to learn a little bit more about the Hunting Beagle World and what to expect. So. Yeah, yeah. And you see, I'm sure you see a lot of similarities between this and Coon Hounds. There's, a, there's some, uh, a lot of things that are different, but there's also a lot of things that are same. So. Yeah, so today I'd like to talk a little about, you mentioned the World Championship, so I do want to talk about the World Hunt entries, uh, how folks can enter and, and some information on that. And then uh, we'll talk a little bit about the qualifying events that remain. There's only a couple of those. Uh, and then uh, also one that I would really like to talk about, I think you're going to have a lot to say about it as well, is for have a discussion about what new participants should expect. New participants going to a an event for the first time and uh, I think here a while back I went to a different registries events and I really thought about it on the way there is like you know what I've never entered one of these events and it was good for me to be in that position and I'm thinking you know because you kind of get uh, you know you should know but when you don't know you don't know so uh, anybody that's new I'm sure kind of has those uh, butterflies a little bit don't know what to expect but uh yeah. hopefully we, let's talk about some of that stuff yeah Give it maybe some advice and and what they should expect yeah i think a lot of times a season and and even me and you i think when we're putting together uh presentations or podcast notes and stuff it's easy to forget how we started out and the people out there you know there's a lot of people listening to this who probably are just getting into it or, or yeah. aren't as seasoned as you know, to know about intricacies of rules that we talk about a lot. And so I think going back to the basics is really good sometimes it to is. keep a healthy program. Yeah, you know, and we take it for granted. You're right. We get used to it. And yeah. So, yeah, some advice for new participants. Uh, I want to talk a little bit about just the basic scoring system we have in place for hunting beagle events. And then uh, then how about uh, how they would go about to enter a dog on their, you know, come to to the club and. And we'll talk about that a little bit. So let's start with the world champion. Online entries are now open as we speak. Uh, so folks can go. There's two different ways they can enter. As always, you can send in your entry form. If you have one, you can mail it in. We would always suggest just to go take the simple route, go online on our website, UKC's website, and enter online. That's the easiest, easiest way. No mailing. Don't have to worry about that. You'll get a receipt back. And to get to that, they need to uh, go to our website, and uh, there's a link on Beagles of Field on the, our uh, Facebook page. A lot of folks uh, go on there. There's a link on there. You can click onto it. It's going to be ukcdogs.com. From there, go to Hunting Ops, uh, and then from there, go to Beagles. After Hunting Ops, you'll see Coonhounds, Beagles, Curve Feist, all that. Uh, choose Beagles, obviously. From there, there's uh, you'll see some uh, events and programs. Click onto it, and then click onto the World Championship logo. From there, there's several different ones uh, for major events, be it the Nationals, the World uh, Clash of Champions, things like that. Obviously, uh, click onto the Hunting Beagle World Championship uh, logo, and from there you will see uh, everything World Championship. You'll see the event ad has more information for the World Hunt. That is updated for this year. Uh, it has a link to you can see pictures from last year's winner and whole or winners and a whole lot of different things. So, uh, uh, and then on that in that page, you'll click onto a little orange yellow looking button uh, that says Enter Beagle World Online. Pretty simple. Yeah, I can't imagine with the way some of the mail stuff has been over the past three or four years, sending in your uh, receipt and then you really don't know if we have it or not until the the list of entries is posted after the deadline. So I don't know. This takes a lot of uh, the headache and the worry out of it to do it on here. It's a really efficient model. 
And if you have any questions about it, the hunting ops department's always available to help out any way we can. That and you, and that is also another option where you can just call up here and we can take your entry over the phone. But we'd suggest to do it over uh, online and and you'll get an email with that. And that's it's also phone friendly, so you can do it right on your phone. So uh, just a couple things want to make sure uh, that you uh, fill everything out uh, online or on your entry form, make sure one thing that's important in round one in the Beagle world, we, we split them up. That's a little different than what you're used to, right. but we have a round one A or B. So round one A is those dogs that are entered in A are going to run in the morning at seven o'clock, uh, starting on Friday morning at the world championship. And then the dogs in round B are going to run that afternoon in, uh, in, uh, kind of a split round is what it amounts to and really it's kind of it's kind of user friendly because that way if i have a couple dogs qualified i can run one of them in the morning one in the afternoon you know so uh, yeah um uh the other thing i'd want to there's uh that i would always encourage folks to make sure they decide which one of those a or b they're going to enter right we get it sometimes where uh they want to make some changes but know when you uh when you do that, it really can complicate things for the administrators in a hurry if you need to make some changes. It just does. If everybody were to make changes, it would almost be impossible. Right. And we'd probably not allow any changes if that were the, the, the situation. And we want to try to keep that at a bare minimum. So we'd always encourage you to kind of decide what dog you're going to hunt when, being A or B, and uh enter that dog, you know, or when you enter it, make that decision and then stick with that. You're just going to be better served to do that. Right. Uh, we will try to accommodate you where we can. The one thing is we only uh, take up to 120 dogs in round one A that we, that the club is obligated to put in the, in the field for us. So uh, A, the morning round is going to get, uh, those spots are going to get used up pretty quickly. Now, I know in Waynesburg, they're going to be able to take more than that. They'll probably take 130 or so if we have that many. But, uh, you know, beyond beyond that, uh, you know, if it fills up and you're one of the last ones, you know, and we can't take everything we have in A, we have no choice but to put you in, in B. So two things, get entered as soon as you can and eliminate any of those concerns. And number two, uh, get your dog, enter it where you plan on hunting it, and then stick with that. Right. No, it's almost impossible to go from B to A. I hear you tell people that a lot. So kind of on the fence, you're almost better off getting in there early and better being safe and sorry and getting in that A round if that's what you're interested in doing. It It is. You know, it's easier for us to move you from A to B, but not from B to A. And B to A, we just don't allow it generally. So, uh, but yeah, you know, uh, we're really expecting a solid entry this year at Waynesburg. Again, last year we had 252 uh, qualified hounds that were entered in the world hunt. Uh, 256 will make for four full rounds of competition to determine your overall winner, you know, four dog cast. So 256, uh, uh, that comes out to four rounds. Um, last year was, that was a popular place to go to last year. Yeah. And, and I know there was a lot of hype about it. And really, I expect even more dogs qualified this year. I haven't really added it up what we have to date yet, but the qualifiers are looking, numbers are looking pretty good. Uh, but so I would not be surprised if we have over 256, that will in fact uh, create another round if we were to have more than 256. Yeah, I know. I know uh, the thing I love about our world championships is they move around a lot and they give people opportunities to hunt in different places. But like you're saying, with it be going back to a place at a really strong event last year and kind of uh, getting a foothold there and people are familiar with it, you're liable to see a good a good entry here. Yeah. You know, if we have to have another round, there's we'd have two options and, and we're not saying we haven't de we haven't decided yet. We'll probably wait to see what we have before we even we're gonna obviously be thinking about it. We have to, but where would you put that added round in? We have two options. Uh, Friday is not going to be an option to have a third round because we have the bench show in the middle of A and B, uh, but potentially it could be either midday Saturday or we would have to have a second round on Sunday, like a semifinal and a final. I would say the probably the I would assume the most popular decision would be to have uh, three rounds on a Saturday, you know, but uh, but we'll see. But so that that's what we would be looking at if we had over two hundred fifty six dogs. That would be a good problem to have. Yeah, yeah. It, it it is, you know, and and uh, 
But that that four rounds in the world championship, that's a good number of rounds yeah. too. And and uh yeah, so we'll see how things play out and we'll go from there, you know. So uh uh we mentioned, you know, kind of expecting a record entry and why is that, you know, uh, a couple of different reasons. You know, Waynesburg's turned out to be one of the most desirable places right now in the country right now for running beagle events. They uh they put on have put on quite a few uh events here in the last couple of years and done very well. Uh the hunters are loving it out there. They have an abundant rabbit population, plenty of places to hunt uh, within a very reasonable distance as well, uh, and good places to hunt. You know, some uh, uh, places and places where you can score on on rabbits. Uh, a lot of places we go to, you know, you always have your just like coonhound events or whatever. There's four or five guides you prefer guides sure. that have the you know everybody hopes to draw have maybe better spots the same is true here with beagles you know but it seems like in waynesburg they have 20 of those awesome spots yeah. you know so well one thing about it uh, randy moore is at the club contact he, he calls in often and he's all the time working on the community on the fairgrounds he's working with businesses in the community hotels in the community he's been working on this thing for a while now already and he's got his ducks in a row and that's that's another factor in why it's such a successful outside of the hunting terrain the host club being prepared and, and accommodating to the hunters and to ukc is a big part of putting on a successful event Ab- absolutely is and you're right he's called in a bunch you know probably more so than any other uh uh, uh big hunt uh sure. coordinator you know that we I would say so. With, but yeah, he calls in a lot, but he's just uh, got his ducks in a row and, and he's been working on things for a long time, you know. So uh, uh, just like normal, we're going to uh, have a welcome dinner for everybody that's there on Thursday night uh, at the Green County Fairgrounds right there in, in uh, Waynesburg. And it's located right on the main drag off the highway right there, really easy to find. Just Google Green County Fairgrounds and it's, it'll take you right to it. Uh, uh, so that's a free dinner on on Thursday night, and we'll also start confirming some entries on Thursday like we normally do. Um, we will have the other thing that's going to be new this year was last year at the uh, World Championship there they had the uh, a, a local college brought their uh, uh, they have a chef class of some like a special a chef culinary. class yeah okay. So they brought those kids in, and they served uh, breakfast and lunches that uh, we ended up, I think somebody paid for one or two of them, you know, but yeah. uh, they had great food, yeah. and it was a good deal. Uh, but this year, uh, some of the uh, local businesses made it possible that they're paying for all of that for free or breakfasts or breakfast and lunches that's going to be provided by them all weekend long for all the hunters, free of charge. Are you kidding? That's awesome. Jeez. Okay. <laughs> I've been to a lot of events and I ain't never seen that before. Yeah. I How handy either. is that? I know. So, uh, yeah, it's good food on top of that. And, uh, Very that's cool. going to be, yeah, that's going to be awesome. And I know you talk about Randy, you know, they've got a lot of, they're got a lot of giveaways, door prizes, and just, it's even more than what they had last year. Oh. Yeah. Good thing about, you know, a club putting on an event back to back like this, they've had it last year. They kind of know what to expect. Exactly. So. That helps. Absolutely, yeah. it does. So, yeah, again, the World Championship is going to kick off on Friday morning, October 6th. Uh, deadline is going to be 7 a.m. And then uh, for the uh, round 1A. And then the afternoon, round 1B is going to be at 3 o'clock. Sounds good. You said there's yeah. a bench show there as well on, on Friday? That's, yep. The show is going to have, the World Show is going to happen on Friday, and it's going to be between rounds 1A and 1B. So the deadline for that is going to be 1 p.m. And, uh, Folks always want to uh, ask about the qualification requirements. It's very simple. If your dog is qualified for the world hunt, there's no, uh, it doesn't need to qualify for the show, but if you qualified for the hunt, that means you're eligible for the show. Hmm. Or if you have at least a minimum of two cast wins on your dog's record anywhere, it doesn't have to be a qualifier, just any uh, two cast wins that you got anywhere, that will also make you eligible for the world show. Nice. Without being entered in the world hunt. So you'll see, we'll see a few dogs that aren't entered in the world hunt that are in the show, but not very many. Right. So, yeah, that's a cool deal. Yeah. Last year we had a good number of dogs in the show and, and uh, some, I felt like it was uh, the quality that we had last year as, as a whole was uh, very impressive and uh, look for more of the same this year. So 
Uh, uh, let's talk about deadlines to enter a little bit. Want to make sure you get your entry in in time. And it seems like every year we always have a couple that don't make it in time. And gosh, that's frustrating. I hate that week after the after oh. an entry closes, it's the worst. Doesn't matter what event it is, you yeah. know. And it's there's always a couple because we don't want to turn people away. No, but we're no. we're bound by those deadlines and rules too. We can't make exceptions for people, but it's hard to. They sometimes have some good excuses, and it's hard to turn it down. But. <sighs> Yeah, no just, exclusions. Just uh, we we dealt with the, probably the most recent one was a couple for the tournament of champions that you yeah. kind of dealt with for the Coon on ones and a couple of guys that had pretty good excuses, you know. But uh, gosh darn, there's just no exceptions to that, you know. And all we can do is what we're doing here. Just remind you, don't be that guy, right. you know, and get entered. You're always better served to get entered. We mentioned, you know, hey, the online entries are open now. Got your dog qualified? Get them entered. Yeah, get it not? done. Get it done and out of the way. So the uh, the actual date, the deadline to enter is going to be Friday, September 15th. And if you mail it in, it needs to be postmarked on that day. And uh, I would not expect it to make it. If you put it in your mailbox on September the 15th, do not expect it to get postmarked that day. No. It may, but it may not. No. You know, if you're going to wait till the last day like that, procrastinate. I always suggest carry it down you to go the into the post office and watch them mark that. Don't drop it in the drop box. Don't none of that. Go watch them put a mark on that. Thing. Ask them to put a postmark on it that you see if you're going to do that. And <laughs> right. I, beyond that, I would ask to have a tracking number put on it. Yeah, that's if a you're going to mail it. Matter of fact, I would I would say do it online or call you, Casey. A couple bucks for it to ease your mind seems like it's worth it. Absolutely. Uh, those guys that qualified at a regular uh, WQE only, they also uh, get gift certificates from UKC, and those are sent out after the events. Uh, we started sending, I think the first group went out sometime in June. We sent a bulk of them out, you know, for the qualifiers that had already happened. Uh, there is a code uh, that is on that gift card that uh, you can, the you can if you're entering, you can use it to uh you can redeem it online with your entry. Just make right. sure you watch for that and put that code in the online entry and you'll get that uh, that uh, dollars off, whether it's 20 or I think if you won the qualifier first place, I think you had a $40 gift certificate, I think, 30 or 40 something like that. But, yeah. Or you can mail it in with your entry or you can even use it for anything else, uh, UKC, like I've registration been, or what have you. We, we had a... Uh, Hunting Beagle World entries open on the same day as Coonhound World yeah. and Autumn Oaks entries. So we've been getting some called in entries for all three events. Mm -hmm. And I've helped a few people that use their code and just did it online. If you call in, that's what we do. We do an online entry, yeah. same as you would. Yeah. And I've used their coupon code there over the phone and it's super simple. Yeah. Very, very easy to do. Yeah. So if you use it online, your your cert or whatever, that code or whatever, you may as well toss it after that because if you send it in later or try to use it later, it's it, it's it's going to get stopped at some point. It might not get stopped right away, but it'll get it'll catch up with you. It's probably not going to work. We thought about that already. <laughs> yeah, we've beforehand. Got that, we've got that covered. Yeah. So yeah, uh, let's talk about uh, hotels a little bit. There, uh, there's plenty of hotels uh, there in Waynesburg for the World Championship, Hampton Inn, uh, Quality Inn, Super Eight Economy Inn, uh, which is where we stayed last year. I think that's a nice little hotel. All of them are just merely minutes from the fairgrounds there, right in Waynesburg. Yeah. And they're, oh, do most of them have uh, dog cape? You can bring your dog. Are the hotel, are dog friendly most of them for the most part? Some of them are. You need to call ahead and find out or go online, and I think they should tell you. Yeah, don't I, get I surprised don't, when you get yeah. there. Make sure you check yep. that out beforehand. I know the Super 8 is not, you know, so, but I don't know about, I think a couple of the others are. So that's something you might want to check in. Last year, the Economy Inn did a kind of a, a Beagler special for that, and I expect them to do the same. I haven't should have found out, I guess, or asked about that. But, uh, but yeah, uh, ho uh, close hotels and everything. Uh, the other thing, last year we had a bunch of campers. Some guys like to camp, and they have plenty of hookups, uh, which include electric and water hookups right there on the grounds for that for that matter. And and there's a small fee, like 25 bucks a night, I think, for camping if you pull your camper in there. But uh, plenty of spots available. Uh, Randy Moore, uh, the club contact, He uh, that's who you should see. Uh, to pay and things like that when you get there. So, and he'll get you hooked up with a spot as far as uh, there's plenty of spots. So there's not any big hurry to get there, anything for a, you know, a, a better spot, but yeah. So, yeah. 
Um, another thing I want to mention is uh, entry forms for the Eliminators. So this year, the Eliminators were are in February, and we did not, I'm not sure if we did not get entry forms to them to, to hand out. I know you get some of the calls up here at the office as well uh, where they didn't have those or or if they just misplaced them because it's been a while. But in any in any event, uh, we can send them a form if they don't have it. It shows that they qualified at the Eliminator, and it's basically an entry form to send in. Uh, but they don't need that form if they enter online. Yeah, right. You just enter the dog. It's just make sure you have the dog's UKC number correct and all that good stuff. Now, the other thing you didn't, those that qualified at the Eliminator or the upcoming McVeigh event, our last chance qualifier, uh, we don't give those gift cards at those events. Only the WQE only events. So so you won't have that code or anything to uh, on those gift cards for those events. But yeah. Speaking of so, WQEs, there's not very many left, I guess, is there? No, there's not. Uh, you know, we're uh, we're coming down towards the end of July Last month, already. Really. So yeah, it they end in in WQEs only are going to end in in August at the end of August, and then our last chance qualifier is the McVeigh event. So mm-hmm. yeah, I'm glad you brought that up. We have I think three in August. So the Creston Beagle Club in Creston, North Carolina. There's an opportunity to get qualified. Still, that's going to be August fifth. Uh, the Upshur Beagle Club in Buckhannon, West Virginia, is going to be August the 12th. And then the Holston River Beagle Club in Saltville, Virginia, is going to have a qualifier on August the 19th. And you can go onto our events calendar online and check for the the, uh, the entry times and all that. Uh, and I think all three of them, I think, are double hitters. So oh, don't nice. hold me to that. But So you have a couple opportunities there. So. And then we end it with your very last chance qualifiers is like has been for the last six, seven, eight, not 10 years is the McVeigh Memorial in Coshocton, Ohio. And that's going to happen on September 7th, 8th, and 9th. That's a Thursday, Friday, and Saturday. So that's that's one you should go to sometime. Yeah, well, I've talked to, obviously, I see Dave at a lot of our Coonhound events, too, that I go yeah. to. And he's, he talks about it a lot, obviously. Um and then I've talked to you about it a few times, and it seems like a good deal. All the all the raffles and and giveaways that they do there, and uh, if you just win your cast there, any of the three days you qualify for the world. Any any of the any of the cast you win there is going to qualify f- for the world. Wow, that's it a cool has deal. to be a a total score of plus points. Okay. Cast wins just like you have to at a at a regular qualifier. So you can actually get a, a cast win and move on at the McVeigh Hunt. It qualifies as a cast win. Uh, without plus points, a total score of plus points. But in order to qualify for the world, you have to have your cast win has to come with a total score of plus points. I got you. So one of the things they have this year again is uh, they have it kicks off on Friday evening. So their first hunt, I think it's like a 5 p.m. hunt, maybe four or five. You'll have to go online to look. Uh, so you can get in on Friday or Thursday evening already. And then Saturday or Friday, they have two hunts, a morning hunt and an afternoon or uh, later late afternoon hunt. Two on Friday and then two on Saturday again, oh. morning and evening hunt. So actually, there's five opportunities. Five, wow. yeah. And if you if you can't get your dog qualified there, he's probably not going to win the world. Probably. Wasn't your year? Yeah. <laughs> Back to the drawing board. Yeah, yeah. But uh, one thing that they're going to have different. Most is going to be the same as they had last year. Uh, for one, all dogs, all classes are going to be combined. So that means the registered champs, grands are all going to hunt together uh, like they did last year. Uh, one thing that's going to be different on Sunday, instead of or instead of the last round, just have a four-dog winner's pack. They're actually going to have a top 16 championship this year. Yeah. So that's new. It'll be two rounds on Sunday, and that's going to be based on cast wins and this and that. But uh more information go to their uh, facebook page and they have more information there the other one i'd like to uh or i would suggest is to uh we had donnie and dave uh, mcveigh on a podcast back uh last year about this time probably so it was episode 11 is the one they were on so i encourage folks to go back and look up that episode and uh and uh, they talk a whole lot about Everything about the McVeigh the Memorial. The history of the event. It's a really cool list. And it if you is. haven't listened to that, it's, it's one I recommend go listen to. Alan, we both had Dogtra Pathfinder 2s now for a little while. What do you think about yours? 
I'm liking mine. One of the things I had the opportunity to now download a map of an area where I did not have service, and I've used it there, and it has worked flawlessly. I love it. Yeah, I love the crystal clear maps. I love that I never lose reception on my dog's collars anymore. Highly recommended by me as well. Dog Trip Pathfinder 2, the official GPS collar of UKC. So, uh, Trevor, let's talk, uh, uh, change gears a little bit and talk about uh, new participants coming to a hunting beagle event in this case, uh, which could be uh, different UKC events, a, a lot of similarities with coon hounds or, uh, but here, but uh, let's talk about give some advice for new, new people coming in. Well, just one thing for people to remember out there is that everybody goes to an event for the first time at some point in their life. And uh, when somebody comes to an event for the first time, you know, help them best you can. Because if you can remember back and remember what you felt like going into the club, you know, you may be nervous. Not everybody is. Uh, can be a little intimidating. It is. It's yeah. very, it is intimidating. And especially for some folks. And uh, help them out. Help them out. Take them under your wing. wing give them some good advice. Yeah. And, and help them. Help them move forward. We need those folks. Absolutely. They're in the onset. I mentioned that I went to a new one for me uh, here a while back. And. Never would have thought about it till I was getting close to it. I'm thinking, gosh, I've, this could be very different than what I'm used to. And it kind of played on me a little bit. But I thought, uh, you know, this is, this is why uh, we should have something where we talk about things like this and give some, hopefully, hopefully, and give some good advice. You know, I would start with, you know, obviously you kind of want, would like to know the rules. I, one of the first things I would suggest is get, you, get your hands on a rule book, you know. You can, you can order one through our website or call our department. We can send you a rule book for it. That would be one of the things. Uh, number two that I would suggest, instead of just taking a dog that you have, go into a trial the first time, I would suggest you go, go to a trial and watch some casts run. Yeah. you can. Uh, the rule book is a great thing. And you mentioned ordering a rule book. I've got to where I have a PDF downloaded to my phone, and I can click on that thing at any time, whether I got service or not pull up the rule book and you can search yep. keywords in there. That's an awesome way to do it. If you're familiar and know how to use your cell phone good. And, uh, but it's hard. You can read the rule book 20 times, 30 times, but it's hard to kind of imagine those rules until you get out into the woods and see how, and in the field and see how it works. Watch and, them in motion. Exactly. Yep. And I don't think your first time ever going on a hunt should be when you're in it handling. Yeah. Then you're going to be really confused. You may get defensive, especially if you go into it with the wrong mindset that people are out to get you if you believe what you see online. That's not the case. You're really going to find out when you go and spectate a couple of them and hear the way people talk and calling their dogs and, and how things are scored and how that stuff works. It's going to help a lot to build a solid foundation for how you understand the hunts to go before you ever jump in. Yeah, there's a, so, uh, a whole lot of value in there. And go watch. You know, I mentioned double headers. You know, some of those qualifiers coming up might be double headers. A double header is where there's two events on the same day, multiple events on the same day. You know, so you have one trial and you, that ends, that is it, and then they have another one. Uh, so in the case of this, I, you have plenty of opportunities to go uh, watch some dogs run and go out on some casts. Uh, you know, okay, you might not even really know anybody. You know, you come into a UKC hunt for the first time and, uh, you may know a couple of guys, but where you're going, you don't know any of them. And that can be a little intimidating, too. We get that. But uh, uh, what can we do about that? One thing, I, a couple ideas I would suggest is to uh, contact, the, if you don't have a friend who's who you're going with, uh, contact the club contact, which their name and number is on all their ads, you know, event ads, uh, to ask them to maybe set up uh, somebody for them to tag along with. Yeah. Is one is one thing. or Call us up here, and yeah. we can, we, you and I know all the clubs, whether it's a Coonan club, most of them anyways, you know, and I think for Beagle clubs, especially, I know every one of them, and I'm familiar with somebody in, in that area. I could definitely offer some suggestions and, and even reach out to some folks to, hey, uh, Joe here wants to tag along, and could you kind of take him under your wing a little bit and show him? I was going to say yeah. the same thing. I've had that happen a few times where, he may not even be a club officer. I may just know somebody who's a member of that club or goes to that mm -hmm. club a lot and, and kind of introduce them. And if you're new to the to the events, like you said, it can be overwhelming walking in there. But if you at least know that, if you know somebody that's going to be there that you've communicated yeah. with before or yep. you, you can seek out somebody who you've, who you've been introduced to, 
that's a lot easier. Yeah, sure is. So that's what I would suggest. And like I said, uh, call call UKC Hunting Ops Department and just ask for Trevor or, or myself, and we'll get you we'll get you hooked up with somebody. Uh, don't make that a don't make that issue. As so long as you give us a little time, you know. Right. Uh, don't call us the day before. You know, give us a little bit of time. We'll get you hooked up. Um, another one that I would suggest is before you go to an event, if you have your own dogs, practice at home. Take the get we that's another thing we can do. Somebody just wants some practice scorecards. We can send them some scorecards. It's not a problem, but practice with your own dogs at home and maybe do some simulated hunts with your buddies. Yeah. You know, just practice. I like the idea. And some with coon hounds, it can be a little bit I don't like hunting more than one or two coon hounds at a time, but I don't want to handle that many dogs. Mm-hmm. Um, so you got to hunt with multiple other people. And sometimes it's hard to, to get that together on the same, uh, schedule as people. But if you're hunting beagles, especially, heck, you can, most people hunt three, four or five at a time. You could almost just have your own pack out there and just score them as they go and, and do it that way. Of course, you want to hunt with some strange dogs and different people, uh, to get acclimated to how that feels as well. And for your dogs to be introduced to different scenarios and different dogs, but heck, you any Sunday morning that you're out there running with just you and your four dogs, you could turn into a competition yeah. and, and put those into real life scenarios. Yeah. A little easier than creating your own baseball team. You know, you don't <laughs> have to have nine kids to have your own baseball team. Here. You that's can right. have a hunt with three or four dogs. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, one thing that's going to be very important with, uh, with hunting, uh, in our hunting beagle format, it's uh, a lot of guys call it the hound and hunter format. What they mean by that, it's where the handler, the hunter or the handler actually calls their dog during the during regulation time in other words what we mean by calling is if a dog opens up or whatever i have to strike sparky i have to call sparky when he opens i have to say trevor strike sparky you're going to record that whatever strike positions were available so uh it is very important that i know my dog's voice there and so if you're going to compete uh in that hound and hunter format you it is highly important very important that you know your dog's voice and not just that that you learn all their different barks and every bark that dog makes yeah i was gonna say it's uh when i go out hunting and it's just me and my dog i can obviously i know what my dog is i can pay attention to it a lot if you get your dog with another dog how does it how does it what barks does it let out when it's with with another dog what barks does it make when it's on a hot track or it's trying to grub up a colder track or it's in a thicket or you know it's in some open running you can Learn a lot just by sitting there and paying attention with your dog and just spending some time paying attention to your dog. For sure. And I think even even if you've hunted for a good while with a pack of dogs and your own dogs and you know what they sound like, you put in put yourself in a competition environment like that and you're hunting against some strange dogs, you're going to quickly probably start questioning yourself, hey, that sounds like my dog. Is it or is it not? You know, but it just... If you get a good experienced handler doesn't even worry about that. If they know their dog well, it's just it's just second nature. They just know right away. Oh, yeah. You know, and and a dog has to really really, you know, usually there's something, yeah. a different tone, a different something, you know, but that's really need to learn your dog's voice yeah. and learn it well. If you're like me, you'll get out there and every dog you hear sounds exactly like your dog in a competition yeah. whether it's a 90 pound male or a 20 pound yeah. female. I'm like I get all butter yeah. butterflied up and nervous and everything <laughs> yeah. sounds like my dog. Cows yeah. over there sound like my dog. <laughs> yeah. Cars going down the highway sound like my dog. Yeah. I'll strike whatever. <laughs> yeah. Well, hey, nobody's striking it, I guess. It must <laughs> be. Right. Right. But hey, the one one reason for that is, you know, there's a scoring system and and uh you're putting a lot of pressure on your dog if you're miscalling your Absolutely. dog. Absolutely. Because if you miscall, it's not just like a oh sorry, you know, or you know, there's demerit points yep. for do, calling somebody else's dog or not calling your dog when it is, in fact, your dog that's opening. So that's one thing that's important in the Hound and Hunter format, learning your dog's voice. I know we, we may get there uh, already, but is there, you know, in the Coonhound events, there you have three barks to call. You have to call it your is. dog's truck on or before the third bark. We have the same exact rule. Same rule. Okay. Same rule. Yep. Okay. Yep. So, yeah, we'll get to that in, yep. in a little bit. So, uh, Another thing uh, that I would suggest is make sure you get your dogs to handle well. By handling, I'm, we're, we're meaning when you call them in. You know, you can use telemetry systems on your dogs in the events, but you cannot use a shocking collar or a toning or anything like that. Uh, you can you can use the telemetry 
uh, system only. So a dog needs to come in when you call them and this and that. And dogs are actually handled quite frequently during uh, hunting time regulation. Right. You know, if you have a dead track, you know, there's there's time, you know, there's a lot of things that are done on the watch, you know, a time thing. And, you know, if the track's dead, we all got to go handle our dogs, catch our dogs, leash them up and and cast recast them again simultaneously, maybe in a little bit different area. But so it's important that your dog does handle well. Yeah. You don't you know, want to get scratched for that. No, because there's also, yeah, there's also a time when if you can't catch your dog, they're going to have the clock on you and give you X amount of time. And you have a good amount of time, you know, but uh, but you want to uh, have a dog that handles well. Sure. And it's something you need to to work on dogs before you put them in a, in a, in a hunt. Yeah. Um, the other, another one I would suggest is uh, don't start out uh, with uh, expectations that are too high. Especially when you're green like this, you know, uh, I kind of learned the rules a little bit. If you, if your dog does well and you win and this and that, that's, uh, that's all great and dandy, but, uh, don't, uh, don't come in with expectations that are too high and be too disappointed or discouraged, I guess. We, we've all lost most yep. of us and I've been, most of us have lost more than, than we ever win. And it's just part of it. Uh, you know, you're drawing three, four dog cast, you have way less a percentage to win than you do to lose yep. and uh, knowing how to lose and, and coming in with realistic expectations. Because like I said, if you're out there hunting with just yourself or on your own hunting spots, that dog's familiar with that. It's going to look good in those spots. A lot of times, if you're hunting the same spot over and over again, it's going to know where to get struck Going to know how rabbits run in that area specifically, possibly you go to new hunting areas, you put them with strange dogs, uh, different situations. A lot of times the dogs aren't going to look the best at first until they kind of get used to that and acclimated to those situations. So Mm -hmm. be realistic about it and know that even if you lose, it's a learning experience for you and it for your dog, it's going to get more and more used to that competition and competing against strange dogs Mm -hmm. and, uh, and just keep your goals where they are and and work towards those goals. Yeah. You know, I, I can remember from experience with, with our own dogs that we had, and we had some pretty decent dogs. We could, we, uh, got a lot of rabbits with them. Uh, started taking them to some trials and and a good solid little dog, but uh, learned pretty quickly that they just weren't they didn't quite fit the format the UKC format at the time. Uh, for one, uh, they were too slow. Gotcha. The ones that we had and uh, and it, it I was I was hooked on it though. As soon as I got into it, it's like any other sport. It's competitive and and uh, I, I was hooked on it and. I actually ended up uh, getting me a little bit different strain of dog. Uh, it was a little bit, little bit. Uh, uh, I don't want to scare folks because I'm not saying our dogs aren't that fast, you know, but what I had at the time just wasn't that speedy, you know. But uh, I loved it so much I ended up getting me, went out and get me a Branco dog, you know. <laughs> yeah. I am competing, you know. <laughs> I need something I can compete with. But, uh Yeah. Uh, so yeah, we're, you know, the handler and the hound is, it's a, it's a team combo really, you know, uh, if the dog screws up, that's one thing, but if the handler messes up, that's on you and, uh, it'll make it a lot harder to win very quickly. Competition can be pretty tough, you know, and sometimes it's, we're talking, you know, at the end of the, at the end of regulation, when you look back, sometimes how many events have you won by just a little bit? And you think, man, what could I have done? Had I not yeah. done that, had I struck my dog on the second bark instead of waiting until the third, I would have had a position higher and I'd be winning here. And yeah. a lot of things like that. Oh, there's a lot of that stuff. And you'll you'll learn as you go when and, and how to, to make some calls, but you're not always going to get it right. Or there's always going to be, well, if I did this or, or I shouldn't have done this. And yeah. I think a lot of times the mindset is just to go in there and as a handler, Try to limit your mistakes and, yeah. and make the dog be the one to lose. Don't you yeah. be the reason the dog yeah. loses. And, you know, I don't want to plant the seed. You don't also want to just second guess yourself too much either, you know. But you got to, like I said, you got to start somewhere. But knowing your dog is is big. And, and like I mentioned, you know, you want to make sure you call your dog and you don't want to call the wrong dog because those are demerit points, you know. So, and did we mention again, study and learn the rules? If, or, you, if you know the rules and you know your dog, you're going to have some success in the hunt. Yeah, but like you like you mentioned, begin with, you know, it's one thing to study and learn them, know what they say, but to go out there and apply them and watch how they are applied is... is uh, uh, totally different. Yeah, yeah, for sure. So uh, let's uh, kind of wrap this up here. Let's talk a little bit about the 
basics, uh, the scoring basics of a hunting beagle event, if you don't care. Sure, absolutely. So, I'm excited to learn some things here. Yeah. So, uh, you know, really it was set up to actually simulate an actual hunt, like a rabbit hunt. So, uh, uh, you know, dog, you take your dog out, uh, jumps the rabbit. Uh, me, the hunter, I'm waiting for the, in, in terms of cottontails anyway, they're going to go out and circle around and usually come back to where you jumped them in the same general area. So me as a hunter, I'm going to let my dog go out and run this sucker and he's going to circle it back to me. And when he brings it back, I'm going to hopefully harvest this rabbit, put it in my uh, bag. So the, the scoring system is basically uh, set up uh, around that concept right there. So you have, uh, you have your strike points. Uh, which is like the jump, jumping the rabbit. So there's a set of points for that, a point system. And then there's the checks and recoveries. Checks and recoveries are things that happen within this, uh, when they're running, it's something that is just, uh, you know, that's a common thing. You always have little, a check is, is what we call a momentary uh, breakdown in the track. Dog loses it for a little bit and then picks it up again. So there's points there for when they go into a check and when the dog that recovers it. And then the third uh, basic uh, that comes into play is we score lines. Uh, lines is where the rabbit comes back around all the way back around to the hunter, basically where we see it. And uh, we, we call a line. The, the dog goes by this little sapling somewhere. We mark it right there. There's a line. And we create this line as the dogs come through. We score them one, two, three, four. Gotcha. Four dogs are drawn out in a cast, and there's points for that. So that's kind of the uh, the the three things. So let's start with strike uh, positions. So uh, there's four positions available. Uh, first dog struck uh, is going to receive a hundred. So we talked about uh, handler calling his dog when it opens up. If you're the judge, I'm going to say uh, Trevor strike Sparky. And if I'm the first dog struck, you're going to write me down for 100. The second struck dog is going to receive 75. The third struck dog is going to receive 50. And the fourth struck dog is also going to receive 50. So there's no difference between third and, and fourth. Gotcha. Uh, oftentimes with beagles, uh, they are, you want them to pack up. You know, so oftentimes after the first, especially after the first and second dog are struck in, then it's just kind of a harking contest after that. You know, in other words, uh, uh, that's, join in the yeah, greatest. more yeah. joining in versus, uh, you know, that they did a whole lot, I guess, at right. that point. So, yeah. Uh, there is, in fact, on the very first turn loose, uh, when you turn loose on the very first, when the hunt starts, we have a three-minute grace period uh, on the first turn loose only where you do not have to strike your dog when it first opens. Uh, but uh, after that first three minutes, you can, but after that first three minutes, and the judge will tell you that three minutes are up. When they tell you that, that means I now have to call my dog on or before the third bark. You, you asked about that a little bit ago, and we have the same rule here like you do in Kunal's. Yeah. So is that just on the initial turn loose or is that every time you handle the dogs and turn them loose? That's every time okay. I handle the dog and turn them loose. Whenever we strike them, it has to be the first time you get a three minute grace period at the start of the hunt. After that first three minute grace period, which is unlike your coon hounds, there is no more grace gotcha. period. Okay. Anytime we handle dogs after that and turn them loose and they open, it's on, on or, before or before the third, third bark. bark. Gotcha. So I can strike them on the first bark or the second bark or the third bark. But here again, that's where we come, uh, where it comes in. We're knowing your dog, you know, maybe on that first bark, it's okay. If I know my dog well enough, that's not a good bark. He's probably not even going to bark again, you know? So I may know to pull off till I, till I have to like the third bark, that's part of good handling. Or maybe I know that first bark is already, that's uh, going to be a good one. I'm going to nail him right away. Call yeah, him. Right. You know, so, so yeah, 175, 50 and 50 for the four strike positions in a cast. So now the dogs are, are up and running. The next part, we talked about checks. So a check occurs after the dogs, no dog is opening up anymore. No dog is barking for a period of one minute. The, as soon as dogs aren't barking anymore, the judge is going to start his clock. And if one minute goes by and no dog opens up, that is declared struck, no dog opens, he's going to call out check. So the, all the dogs are in check. 
And now the next scoring opportunity is to listen again for these dogs. And the first dog to open that results in the track going back to a runnable state again is going to get that recovery. Nice. And there's 20 recovery points for that dog. Yeah. So it's kind of simple there. Yeah. And then I mentioned lines. So here again, we have four line positions. So they bring the rabbit around. We see the rabbit goes by this whatever little uh, landmark of some kind. We're going to mark it right there. Uh, and there's four positions. The first uh, first uh, dog to come through the line is going to get 100 points, line points. Second dog is going to get 85 line points. Third is going to get 70 line points. And the last dog to come through is going to get 55. Now, sometimes you have dogs right up next to each other. That's basically a tie. You can't say who got uh, whatever position. There's uh, there's tie uh, positions. Like you can yeah, split positions. Split them. Yeah, okay, split gotcha. positions. That's noted on your scorecards, but that's it. So 185, 70, and 55 nice. for line points. Uh, and you can score on the same rabbit no more than three times. So if they circle the same rabbit, it comes around the second time, you call a line again third time. After the third time, after a rabbit has been scored three times, uh, then you have to handle the dogs, pick them up, and go compete for a new rabbit again. That's when that handle comes into, into yep. play. Yep. And here in this case, sometimes after you've scored three lines, um, you know, the rabbit, the dogs are still on it. It doesn't matter. You have to go handle them. And sometimes that can be kind of tough. A little easier like, said than done just yeah. sitting, thinking about it. You might it? have to run them down. I'd have a hard time calling mine in off of it. But yeah. Yeah, off a good running yeah. rabbit, I can imagine. Yeah. So uh, so let's talk a little bit about losses. Uh, so after uh, losses are is... When the dogs are struck in, a dog or dogs are declared struck. Um, if the majority of the dogs in the pack, in the cast, are struck in and they go into a loss. We talked about a check uh, is after one minute, but after three minutes and there's just no progression or no barking or no progression of the, uh, of the track. Sure. Dogs can be barking around a little bit, but just not going anywhere with it. The judge is going to keep a, 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 or eye on his watch, and if three minutes goes by and there's just no progression, he's going to call for a dead track. So if the majority of the dogs are struck in when this occurs, they're all going to take a 50 minus, regardless of where they were struck in. If, uh, if majority of the cast or majority of the dogs are not struck in, then those dogs that are struck in are going to get their strike points minus. Mm. And what that the difference is, you know, like the first and second struck dog would get 175 for the second one. The difference is, is that's why you also don't want a loose barking dog because if they're too quick to open and don't make good on it, they're going to be held accountable. If they can't make any good on this track, they have a lot more to lose too. Right. That's they have a, a lot to gain, but they also have a lot to lose if they can't uh, make, uh, you know, I can get imagine, the track going. I can imagine that's a major fault in, it is. in beagles and rabbit yep. because – when you have dogs harking into that, yep. you want them to be on an actual track and not a false track or just yep. booger barking, as yep. I guess some people would call it. But yep. <clears throat> So that's kind of the basic part of it. You know, I mentioned the no progress rule that, that might apply, you know, when the dogs are running. They're just not going anywhere. Like I mentioned, after a period of three minutes with no ample progression, uh, the judge will call for uh, the track is considered dead. And, you know, and then after that happens, you, ha you, you, you ask the question, you know, why did it end? It could be a couple of things. They may have just might have just flat lost it, just can't find it, haven't recovered it, or it could have. It could technically have went in a hole. The rabbit could have went in a hole or a place of refuge. So after we're going to handle dogs now, dead track. We're also always going to handle dogs when the judge calls dead track, and then we're going to figure out what happened with this track. Is it just a dead? Did they just lose it? And in the case of that, there's going to be minus points awarded for the demerit points for the dogs. Uh, the other one, if it was a hole or a place, if we determine, okay, they went, obviously this is where it ended and right here's a, a place of refuge or right here's holes right here, we're not going to fault the dogs for that. Right. So we're not going to demerit them. So we're going to need to find out why they lost it. Right. You know, so a place of refuge or a hole would be that. But if they just lost it, we don't have that. We need to minus demerit the dogs. Okay. Makes sense. Um, so there's a, also a thing for a dog, and in the summertime, we probably see it more than any other time, and that is, uh, you know, dogs not hunting. They have five minutes, a dog comes into the cast, just sits around uh, after five minutes, or after three minutes of sitting around not going hunting, they're going to get 100 minus. Uh, and after five minutes, they're going to get disqualified. 
Some other disqualifications during a hunt is if a dog uh, runs off game, uh, gets caught fighting, uh, or like I mentioned, not hunting for five minutes, or they have accrued a grand total of 300 minus on the scorecards. So, uh, and then at the end of the hunt, uh, it's just a matter of subtracting your minus points uh, from your plus points. And it's, it's very seldom that you go to a beagle hunt that not every dog has some minus points. Right. That's common. Sure. Checks it or what have you, you know, that's very common. Uh, so simply subtract your minus points from your plus points, and that's your uh, uh, total score for the dog. And obviously the dog in the cast has the best total score is your winner. Yeah. So, yeah. Uh, the amount of uh, hunting time that all of our hunting beagle events, they have either 60 or 90 minutes. And that, those times are announced at the club on the day you get to the, to the event. You know, and it may be, uh, you know, 90 minute hunts are pretty popular, but it may be a hot, hot day or it, the sure. weather might be bad. They might decide, you know what, we're just going to run for 60 minutes today, whatever it might be. Right. And generally dogs are separated into two categories registered. Those are dogs that don't have a champion degree. And then the champions and the grands, they run together in a second separate category. And uh, there's certain events where all categories are combined. You know, an example is the McVeigh hunt that we mentioned here right. on this podcast. They all the the dogs are uh, spe some special events. They all draw out together, regardless of category. Uh, the World Championship is another one where they all draw out together, and Eliminator is another one. So, but yeah. And then you know the other thing that I was always mention. I hear this sometimes. Oh, what uh, uh, what does what does a UKC dog look like a title dog? You know, I know in some other formats, you know, a, dog, a field trial champion is a big deal. You know, and we a field trial champion for us is kind of the intermediate title for dogs. Our ultimate title is the Grand Hunting Beagle Champion, um, and I think with our rules that we have, uh, if you have a dog that made Hunting Beagle Champion. It couldn't be trashy. You know, those dogs are going to get disqualified. And, right. and if you have a dog that's a little trashy, uh, it's just there's too much off game out there. And, too, you know, they're just probably not going to earn that title. But I've heard it say, and I would agree, you know, oftentimes if you have a hunting beagle champion or grand hunting beagle champion, the dog will solo well, it'll handle well, and is not trashy. And it's really, it's the type of dog that you would take rabbit hunting uh, with in a pack of dogs or even just by itself and you would s expect to be successful with the dog so trevor let's uh wrap this up a little or uh by uh ending it with the uh what a first timer might expect going to an event and what the procedures might look like and what they should do so um first question is is your dog registered or is it not uh, you can do that before an event you can get with the united kennel club and we can get you fixed up but you can also do it there at the club. At a hunting beagle event, you can. And if you have your dog registered through with another registry, with whether it be NKC or AKC or something, bring a copy of your dog's pedigree. That's going to help a whole lot. Yeah. And they will have forms at the club for you to register your dog there. Just go in there, get with, go up to the entry table, and just tell somebody, hey, I need to register a dog, and they will get you set up. Yeah, in most cases, isn't it just as long as you have the AKC paperwork? Do you even need pictures of your dog if you have the AKC paperwork? You, no, you don't. So Not it's just as simple that. as right. filling out the single registration yep. form and having the AKC paperwork. Yep. And you're set. Yep. And if you don't, and then there's also somebody there, they will set somebody up to sign off on your uh, on your uh, uh, on your application, your registration application. So you've got your dog registered or whatever and all that. So the first thing you want to do is fill out an entry slip when you get there, and the entry slips are a little. Uh, two inch by four inch uh, slips with a sticky, uh, we call them an entry sticky. And it's the, you uh, put your dog's information on their dog's name, UKC number. And in the case, if you don't, if you registered your dog on the day of the event, you don't have a UKC number yet. Don't put your AKC number or some other registry number on there. Just put pending on right. there if you don't have a number. Uh, but then the, you're going to fill that out and that same sticky is what they're going to use to put in the draw and draw and, and stick on your scorecard for when you're out in the field. Uh, the next thing you have to do at every event is measure your dog. And the, your dog can't be over 15 inches. Uh, if it is, uh, and it's based on their measurement, whoever's measuring there, um, if it's over 15 inches, they're not going to allow you to enter the dog in the event. Yeah. So. At, your, at some of your major events, I don't want to get uh, off on a rabbit trail, but you offer permanent measurements that can go right on your easy entry card and can kind of take that 
process out of it, correct? It, you're right. There's certain events like the World Championship we'll be doing it. Our Nationals will do it. The McVeigh Memorial will probably have it there as well, uh, where we have UKC officials there to permanently measure dogs. And you can do that once the dog is at least 18 months of age. Gotcha. And there's like a $15 fee, $15 or $20 fee. And then you will, that measurement will go on the dog's record and will go on your easy entry card. And in that case, you don't ever have to measure your dog again. Otherwise, you have to measure it at every trial. Right. Now, I say every trial, we mentioned double headers. If, uh, if it's the same weekend, like a club has a, whether it's a double header or a two day event, you just need to measure it one time. Nice. Okay. Not every, not at the second double header or the next day, uh, but at every event. So, yeah. uh, then, uh, you've got that done. You filled out your entry slip. You've, you've turned it in. You're going to pay your entry fee to the entry takers. And then you just, uh, sit or want around and wait. Most of the time the club will have some breakfast there, you know, uh, get that out of the way and go get you some breakfast. If, uh, if you, uh, need some, what have you. Um, and the next thing that's going to happen is that they have an entry deadline. Entry deadlines are very important in UKC. There's no exceptions to it. If you're running late, uh, are late for any reason, doesn't really matter. Uh, I think on an episode here just recently, you and I had talked about uh, deadlines. You know, there's just no exceptions for them. Uh, if the deadline is 7 a.m., that means you need to be in line to enter at 7, not 7.01 or 7.05. They're not going to take it. Absolutely. So, um, so the next thing that, that happens is the officials are going to draw the cast. Uh, they're going to take those entry slips and draw them out. And then there's a judge selection process. Uh, most of them are going to be hunting judges, meaning the, the judge is also going to have a dog in the cast, but they, they try to pick the best uh, judges that they have from their drawing them from their pool of entries. And let's say they have, they're going to have uh, eight casts of dogs. That means they're going to need eight judges. So they're going to go through their pool of entries, pick out eight qualified or judges, and they're going to put one on each scorecard. Right. You know, so every cast now has a judge. The next thing they need to look for, every cast needs to have a hunting guide too. Most of them are hunting guides. So let the judge may or may not be a guide. So let's say card number one, the judge is a guide, so they're, he's good there. Cast number two, that judge is not a guide. So we also need, let's say, uh, we, you know, we've figured out who can guide from this pool of entry. So we have those entries separate. So now I'm going to take from the pool of, or they're going to take from the guide pool, and then they're going to draw one on this card and so on. Until every cast has a judge and a guide, then they're going to take the remaining entries and fill up the rest of the cast. Right. That's how the draw process Simple works. Process. Yep. Uh, and then... Uh, Mention double headers. You know, if, if they have a double header, you can enter for the second one, you know, after the first one, and they'll do that whole process again. But you don't have to measure your dog again, like I said. Uh, and then some clubs will have shows as well. And uh, you can you can enter your dog uh, in the show uh, so long as you hunted the dog that day uh, or you have a minimum of two cast wins. Gotcha. And if you have that two cast wins, you don't you can show without having hunted the dog. Yeah. But yeah. It's a really simple. I mean, it's it is. it's really simple. You know, for like we talked about, this is geared towards first timers. The thing is, don't be afraid to get in there and shake hands with people and meet people and ask questions if you have questions. And yeah, and that's the only way you learn. Yeah. We all had we all were there one day, so we understand. Yeah. yeah. So and you know, hey, be reasonable. We mentioned about not having uh, your expectations too high. Mm -hmm. um, uh, have fun, and you know, the other thing we always say: you, it's amazing how many good folks you meet in this sport. Yeah, hopefully we've covered some uh, some different uh, uh, different things here for first timers or new participants that will help them. And and like I said, always call the hunting ops department if you have any other questions or if we can help you in any way or get you hooked up with somebody that might uh, uh, help you out. Why we'd be more than happy to. So. Thanks for listening to the UKC Hunting Ops Podcast. Be sure to give us a follow wherever you get your podcasts so you don't miss out on new episodes.